so glad that we're here today. Good to have worship where we can center our minds in on the Lord and uh, allow him to soften our hearts and kind of get our trajectory straight ahead. Before we go, please pray with me. Father, thank you for this day. It's a day that you chose to give to each one of us. And as your word says, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. It's a decision that we put our face to you. It's our decision that we allow you to be the Lord of our lives again this morning and that we thank you for all that you've done. To list them would take all day. But I thank you for this time and for these people, for your word that speaks to our hearts, that nourishes our soul so that we might know you better. This morning, Lord, we bring our pains and our failures and our frailties before you, and you know them well. I pray that you might minister to each one of us in that place where we need. So guide us, Lord, and help me as we look at your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we finally got into chapter 11 in Genesis where we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel or Babel or Babel or however you want to. You just go ahead and have fun with that. I, I call this the big man plan. We were introduced to Nimrod previously, if you remember who he was. He was a hunter of men, actually. He was this great hunter and declared so in the scriptures. Uh, so now we're going to get the expanded story of actually what happens with him. But first, we're going to talk about what we talked about last week, which is the survivors of the flood, Noah and his wife and Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all of them repopulating the world as the Lord told them to, and the areas in which they came. And I painstakingly went through 70 nation names and had to explain to you who they were. And it was harder for me than it was for you. So if you thought it was hard to listen to, try putting it together. So basically, this is where everybody ends up. And uh, we went over all the ites uh, in, in Canaan area. We talked about Nimrod, who was this mighty one on the earth, and how he was in charge of these cities, Babel, which he starts, Erech, Achad and Kalna. So these are the cities he starts, and he's like the first world dictator, okay? So he's taking over and running these things. It was done in Shinar. Now, if you look on this map, you'll find Shinar, Shinar is located up here. Um, most people are agreed it's between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, the place of canals, which is actually what Shinar means. So that's where it is, and whether you believe it's north or south, either way, but it's, it's in the area of uh, Iraq, which is Iraq, which sounds a lot like Iraq, so that wasn't too hard to figure out. So there's all of these areas, which we looked at last week, and all of this being recorded for us so we might understand the lineage of who Jesus Christ is. Little did the writers know, obviously, when Moses was writing this down, that this is why all of these names were here, so that Jesus could be tracked all the way through. And you'll see the scripture talks about everything, and it kind of keys in on one person, or in one area, or one tribe. And it talks about everybody, and then it kind of keys in. And after this chapter, we're going to see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. It's a spoiler. That's the rest of Genesis, is just the lives of those four men and tracking them. And so that's how the scripture is. It talks about the, the world and society and about what God's doing, but then it singles in on someone that God puts his finger on. And so we're going to see that all the way down to Jesus Christ. This week, we're going to go over the Tower of Babel, uh, which is a rather interesting thing. So we'll, we'll just hit it. Verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, 
Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they have one language. This is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. It sounds like it's just an interesting failed construction site story, but it's a bit more than that. Notice it wasn't just a tower, it was a city and a tower. Most people remember the tower, but they don't remember the city that actually is to encompass it. So it's about cities and towers. Now we have cities and towers, right? And it's always a competition as to which one is the tallest. Right? I don't know if you remember the days when, you know, Macy's used to have a big one. And uh, there are all, uh, all these different people that build at different times. Just to give you an idea of size, um, the, you've got one in Taiwan and China, another one in China, another one in China. It's a, it's a competition, really. And here's one World Trade Center, which doesn't look so... It's basically that big long needle that's sitting on top that, you know, so if you make a big tall antenna, I guess that counts. But you'll see, here's, uh, here's in Seoul, Korea, there's their building. You've got um, this other one that's in China. And then you have this one in Mecca in Saudi Arabia, which is a clock tower, which is huge. And then you have a couple others, and the, the largest one is in Dubai. And you may have seen this one. It's... Uh, rather modern in, in the way that it looks. So those are the, the world's tallest towers, since we're talking about towers. Here's a proposed one for the future. By the way, these are those that I just showed you. This is a new one. And it's going to reach over 10,000 feet, which is more the size of a mountain than it is a building. So these are... These are proposed future buildings. So you can imagine what's, what's going on. And why, why do people build towers? It's, it's one of those very strange things. It's this wonderful marvel of man, and it's kind of an exhibition of his artistry and his architecture and the power uh, to be able to make things and do things. And it stands there as a testimony <coughs> to your ego. <coughs> We've got the tallest building. No, you don't. We've got a bigger antenna, and so ours is bigger. It's like a big competition thing, isn't it? That just seems silly to me, because then you have to park. How are you going to do that? You've got to put all the people in those, and you've got to park somewhere. It's, it's ridiculous. By the way, here's another proposed building that they have, uh, which, which is very interesting. This is actually a giant cruise liner, if you wanted to... Uh, idea of how big this facility is. So there are people still talking about going one up. Um, this is for all of you who are afraid of heights. <laughs> and yes, this is them working on the World Trade Center. We had a, a couple of tall towers which stood very proudly in New York City. And uh, it, was, it was a huge fixture. Just to give you an idea of size, this is, this is the lady. So that's the uh, Statue of Liberty. And if you go by there, that, that looks pretty big until you look at the towers. Uh, those, of course, are not there because the problem with towers is not only are they fixtures, but they also tend to be targets. And so we've discovered that. Who would have thought an airplane would be a weapon? If you might uh, recall this, this is the Titanic, which there was a bunch of press about it, and it was such a big deal. It was the largest ship ever made, most safety features, the highest degree of luxury. If you could get on board this thing, boy, it'd be fantastic. And unfortunately, you probably wouldn't live because on its maiden voyage, it sunk. Which makes me wonder, 
if you really, do you really want to be the biggest? Do you really want to be the best? Do you really want to have the newest? Do you really want that? Because it seems like there's always disappointment down the road. Get a brand new car. You know what I'm talking about. Park at one time. A windy day, straight carriage at ShopRite. It's not new anymore. It just happens. And it's amazing that they boasted. There were people that were boasting that this was an unsinkable ship. I find it amazing that it sunk on its maiden voyage. And so when I think of the Tower of Babel, I think that this is one of those things. You know, by the way, this is the International Space Station. Uh, it, it's not going to be so international anymore since we're in wars here on the Earth and uh, Russia's given us some trouble. But anyway, uh, if, if you wanted to build a tower up into heaven, like the Tower of Babel, um, this might even qualify as a giant achievement. It's an amazing thing that you can now phone people all around the world. It bounces off satellites and all of that. It's certainly a technological marvel. I wonder if we don't have our own Tower of Babel going on. This is uh, part of an accelerator, a particle accelerator, where they're creating little mini black holes in, uh, in a laboratory. Uh, of course, you can't control a black hole because nobody knows really what it is. Uh, I would be afraid it would just suck me up and that would be the enemy. But uh, these people are playing with things that they don't understand. It's a little bit like the Tower of Babel. They were going to make a tower that went up into the heavens and approaching even God himself. You think of all the things that have been made by man, the Colosseum, the Taj Mahal. We have the, the ziggurats, which are located in um, Mexico. And here's uh, Machu Picchu, which is so nice to say. <laughs> Not knowing, it, it sounds like a sneeze, but no, it's a place. <laughs> and the people have mysteriously vanished. They don't know what happened to them. Uh, but all of these things that are built by man, by the way, this is a mausoleum, if you haven't figured it out. Uh, there, are, there are texts from, of the Quran that are written all around it, and it was a, something that a man built for his wife. Uh, we, we think of things like here in Rio de Janeiro, you have the Christ that stands up on the hill to greet everyone as they party and do crazy things down beneath him, and I wonder if they understand the perplexity of all of that. You, you have another area here out in, the, out in Asia. You have the presidents who you might recognize um, they were actually supposed to continue on with that. But all of these are the, the works of man's hands. They're all designed for people to go, oh, isn't that wonderful? Much like the Tower of Babel. We've even made islands that are artificial. By the way, this is a gigantic island that has been created out in Saudi Arabia. These are artificial islands that people actually live on. And they made it like a giant palm tree. When you look at some of the things that people have built and done, it's, it's absolutely amazing. But I think sometimes we can become very full of ourselves. And I think that's what happened here at Babel. Whether it's the pyramids or whether it's the uh, stone, the rock city of Petra or uh, the Colosseum as we talked about or the Great Wall of China, one of the few things you can see from space actually. Uh, by the way, do you know who China was trying to protect themselves from on the other side of that wall? Russia. Russia is the correct answer. Yes. So it's a, it's a rather interesting thing that they're aligning themselves with them now. So, so let's talk about the Tower of Babel. This is the big man plan. Nimrod says, let's build the city, let's build a tower, and it's going to be the thing to see, the place to go. It'll be the Disney World of our time. Oh, did I say Disney World? I'm sorry. Maybe Disneyland. No, maybe not. Maybe Epcot. So he's going to make it big. And it's, and it's really for his ego, isn't it? I, I wonder if a lot of mega church people aren't building a Tower of Babel. I didn't think I was going to say that, but there it is. So this is, we're going to see all of these things actually as we fly through here. So let's pick it up from the first verse. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. 
boy, how convenient would it be for everyone to speak the same language? Men, women. I'm thinking that would be the first hurdle. You know, I wouldn't have to take any other kind of language going to high school or college. Uh, you wouldn't have to learn a language just to forget it. Just one language. That would, that would be great. I think I'd be better at English if it was the only language. Um, but just to give you an idea, this is where we're talking about in the world, and I have all the modern. So this is basically Iraq, or what, this is Mesopotamia. There are some people that put it up here north between the Tigris and Euphrates, where you might recognize they come together here and go into the Gulf uh, down in Kuwait. So it's definitely this area here. Uh, some people show it lower on the map, and they show it in the southern section. This is Shinar here. So they're not sure if it's the northern or southern Mesopotamian Valley. Uh, and I read way too much last night about why it's one and why it's not the other, or why it's the other, why it's not one. It's in here. They only had one language, which is wonderful. I don't know if you ever sat down and thought about creating a language. I mean, I know they do in Star Trek, and that's rather interesting. But you have to use elements of other known languages, uh, you know, like sounds. Like, there isn't a new sound somewhere, you know, except for maybe in Hebrew, there's a thing. And we don't have, we don't have that anywhere in English. But they have one language. Language is a very difficult, very complex thing. In fact, people are amazed at even where it comes from because it's not something that you can, you can easily build, and yet it's something that you can learn even as a child. I just find that amazing. And so they settled down here in, in this place in Shinar, which they're still not sure where it goes. But see, this is in direct rebellion to what God said all the way from the beginning. If you remember in Genesis chapter one, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and every living thing that moves on the earth. They were told, spread out guys, get it done. And then with Noah, you figure, oh, well, everything's different with Noah, right? Then you're supposed to gather. Well, no. He says here in chapter 9, verse 7, as for you, speaking to Noah, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. That involves moving out, you know, because if you stay in one place, it gets crowded. So you've got to move out. So God's intention is for them to move out. These guys say, nothing doing. We're sticking right here. We're going to make a name for ourselves and we're going to plant right here. So they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. By the way, uh, the Jews usually built with mortar, which is a cement product, and stones, not brick. Brick is a different invention. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. Uh, I don't know if you can imagine that. But building this, they actually stuck them all together with what we understand to be asphalt. Um, the, the word itself in the Hebrew is chemar, which means to bubble up or to rise up. It's actually, you know, what Jed Clampett found in his yard, uh, bubbling up. It's crude oil, essentially, is the base of asphalt. And so that's what they used to put all of these stones together. So they made these bricks and they baked them thoroughly. So they, that's what they built with. There again, another manufactured item. It's not something that they had in the Valley of Shinar. Uh, they had a lot of dirt, and so what they did is they used what they had. But there again, it was a manufacturing of human hands. <clears throat> and as they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So basically, this is Nimrod saying, let's get it together, guy. What a great leader who says, let's let us do this. Let us. And he's kind of this rallying voice and everybody's like, yeah, it's going to be about us. Forget about all them. Who are they? You know, it's about me. It's about I. We'll get a subscription to Us magazine. It's, it's all about them. It, it, it's not about anybody else. It's about making a name for themselves. Uh, so here you have a first celebrity. So they're gathering together when God said to spread. They're making a tower, which is a huge attention-getting symbol of power. And it's to be seen by everybody around. And where's the top going to reach? To heaven. 
Do you think the Lord's going to mind if you move into his territory? It's said that way on purpose. Bab El, actually El is the name for God. Bab means gateway. So it's the gateway to God. They actually thought by building this that there would be a gateway to God. You know, there are people that build gateways to God all the time, don't they? Maybe you need to sit in a funny position and go, oh. Maybe you need some crystals. You need some crystals. <laughs> people are trying to get in touch with God in the ways that God never prescribed them to, much like the Tower of Babel is happening. But this is a gateway to the heavens. And he is building himself up to have a great name. And it's a very different thing because they're gathering all in one place instead of scattering. I find it interesting that they're using this bituminous material between the bricks because it's somewhat waterproof. Do you think maybe they're worried about another flood? I don't know, it's something you might want to think about in your basement, but... Psalm 127.1, this is a song of a sense of Solomon. He says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. The bottom line is, if you have plans, blueprints, objectives, goals that are not of the Lord, it's not going to happen. If they're of God, He'll give you success. But if it's not of God, it won't be successful. As much as you try, by golly, I'm going to stay up all night. And I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to do it. I'm going to put all my energy, all my finances into this thing and make it happen. Well, if the Lord doesn't want it to happen, it won't happen, will it? Which gives me a deep, dark humility and say, Lord, am I doing the right thing? Am I going in the right direction? Do I have the right goals? Do I have the right things in my heart? Or is it about me? I mean, I didn't tell you the $60,000 car that I bought this week. I did not. <laughs> I can't afford a $60,000 car. I got a car for nothing, so I praise God, I can't get a better deal. <laughs> Our society is built on us being the center of the universe. It didn't start with us. It's about, you know, where do I want to live? What do I want to do? Who do I want to spend time with? What clothes do I want to wear? What food will I eat? Where are we going to lunch? It's all about us. It's all about me. What a tragic, tragic mistake when we make our lives about us instead of him. That's what the Tower of Babel really is. But Nimrod is this guy who's full of himself and he gets a bunch of people to follow him. And he's not doing what the Lord would have him do. Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 15, tells us a story of somebody else who sounds a lot like this guy. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground. You are weakened, you, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most holy or the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, which is death, by the way, to the lowest depths of the pit. Interesting how the story of Lucifer, how he was this exalted angel um, and he was brought down. And here's this interesting story. And Nimrod seems to mimic everything that Lucifer himself did. In fact, Nimrod is going to be a precursor of the Antichrist who comes, who's also going to set himself up in the temple of God, uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, and he's going to demand to be worshiped. So, Nimrod and Babylon, which is where the Tower of Babel is, suddenly are this pre-shadowing of the Antichrist who's to come. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do? You know, that's, what, that's not what unity's for. They, listen, it's been easy on them, and they've got one language, and they've all decided to do this, and this is what they do? 
could you have made a better decision? Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. In other words, because they're all agreed, they're all on the same page, they all seem to be following this, there's going to be no stopping these people. So the Lord looks down and says, hey, what's going on here? It's not what the Lord would have happen. Have you ever had a, a sense in which suddenly the Lord sees you <laughs> and he sees what you're thinking and he's like, are you kidding me? It happens to me sometimes. My mind wanders and the Lord goes, are you kidding me? I want you to notice this, the affirmation of unity to di in direct correlation to successful mission. The Lord says, they all have one language. They all agree. They're all on the same page. There's nothing going to be able to stop them. Well, that sounds like a terrible thing when you're not doing the right thing. But what if you're doing the right thing? The principle stands, doesn't it? That's why the scriptures are so big about the unity that we should have. Because we should all be on the same page, literally. The same book. The same savior. The same agenda. And when we are, then there's wonderful success because we're all agreed. And there's definitely strength in numbers. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul speaking, beseech you to walk worthy of your calling with which you were called. And with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our job. It's not to stir up trouble amongst ourselves, but to make peace, to preserve the peace. You know how easy it is to upset people? Some people are more easily upset than others. And don't you like to invent ways to get at them? Apparently, I am here to teach you to not let this bother you. Some people, all you have to do is walk up to them and say, are you okay? And they'll be like, yeah, why? <laughs> Something about your face. Are you sure you're okay? Why? Why? What is it? What is it about my face? What? Do you know these people? Are you, are you are these people? <laughs> It says that we do everything, we should do everything that we can to preserve peace. And sometimes I don't think we remember that. I think we do everything we can to, to push the limits, to, to body check people, you know, and that's not the way we're to be in the body of Christ. And because then you take Hefter Nimrod, you know, he's trying to, to make a kingdom for himself. So we're going to do all that we can to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Amen. Amen. All right. In Romans chapter 12, another admonition to be, it says to be of the same mind toward one another and do not set your mind on high things, not high things for yourself, not high things. In other words, uh, things that are over people's heads, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. No, do what's respectable. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Sometimes we don't think peace is something that we should strive for. And yet the scripture emphatically tells us peace is something we should be striving for, which means sometimes you have to be patient, right? Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's a very different story from what Nimrod's doing. He's just trying to rally people for himself. And if you stood in his way, you just get trampled. That's the way it is. But in Christ, 
That's not how the church runs. Success begins with communication and agreement. Uh, so those of you who are married might understand this principle. Communication, conversation, discussion, so that everything's kind of out on the table, and then you all have to kind of come to an agreement as to how you're going to handle that. It's a terrible thing when two people have a conversation, you think on the same page, and somebody just decides to do their own thing and go this way. You know how harmful that is? Because it destroys trust. And trust is the foundation of any relationship. So communication and agreement. You, got, you guys with me today? Okay. And so what the Lord says is, come, let us go down. And there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there all over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. That seems like a cruel trick, doesn't it? Hey, you're doing something I don't want you to do. Okay, I'm going to make it so that you can't communicate. And you can't agree because you don't understand. Hey, you want to hold this tape measure for me? Okay. That's what you like. It's good. What do you say? What? And so that was the end of that. Because they couldn't have a conversation. They couldn't agree. They couldn't discuss. If, if two were going to walk along, shouldn't they agree? Of course they do. You know, especially a three-legged race like a marriage is. It might be confusing because in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So if God is not the author of confusion, why did he confuse their speech? Hmm. I don't know. Sean will tell you later. <laughs> because God is not the author of confusion, in the church, notice, the Lord's not going to mess that up. You see, it's us who messes that up. In the churches, just, you know, Tower of Babel's a different deal. Job 5.12 gives a little clarity. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. Well, that sounds very applicable to the Tower of Babel, doesn't it? In Isaiah 44.25, who frustrates the signs of the babblers? It's interesting. And drives diviners mad who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness. You see, God's wisdom makes foolish the wisdom of the wise. And he takes the low things of this world and he confounds the wise. That's what he does. So if you feel like God has confused your relationship with you and your wife, it's not him. <laughs> Unless you're trying to do something you shouldn't do and then maybe he will. There again, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. There are limitations to what we can do. There certainly are opportunities for us, but we have limitations, and only the Lord himself is going to make things happen in his time. Amen? Be careful that you don't get stuck uh, opposing him like these guys did with the tower, because the Lord may step in and confuse things. In Acts chapter 2, you may remember the story. This is the birth of the church when the Holy Spirit descends and comes down on the church. And they all began to speak in other languages. Interesting. It's very similar to the Tower of Babel, isn't it? Except it's kind of the opposite. It says here in chapter 2, verse 1, And the day of Pentecost had fully come, and they were all in one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and, and one sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. By the way, these are other languages. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. 
That's the opposite of Babel. God came down, confused their language, and they dispersed. Here, he made everyone listening hear in their own language what was being spoken. That's weird. Do you think that's significant? I think it's hugely significant. And everyone gathered. Isn't that interesting? God can confuse people and cause them to scatter, or he can give clarity where there was nothing that you brought it of your own. It was a gift. And suddenly you have this ability to speak about who God is in another language so that somebody walking by goes, hey, I recognize what you're saying, but you're not, you're not from my town. You're not, you're not a Scythian. You're not from the area of Russia. What the heck are you doing? You're Galileans. You're all speaking different languages. And we all understand what you're saying. And then Peter gets to stand up and give the sermon of a lifetime. And he talks about who Jesus was and why he came and why he died and how at the, the hands of angry men, he was put to death. And they said, they were cut to the heart and they each said, what do we have to do to be saved? And 3,000 of them came to Christ that day. Now there's a sermon for you but that's because the spirit of God was there. It's an amazing thing that to divide these people up, he confused their language. To gather these people over here, he unified their language. Here was confusion. Here was clarity. I think about the, when the law came and Moses came down off the mountain, there were 3,000 that died at the introduction of the law. At the introduction of the Holy Spirit into the church, there were 3,000 that lived. All of these things are intentional throughout the scriptures. None of them are accidental. So Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And oh my goodness, we would need a bigger pool. <laughs> and the Lord brought clarity. 1 Corinthians tells us something about language and something about Babel. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 6 to 11, speaking about gifts in the church, such as the gift of tongues. He says, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues or other languages, what shall it profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life whether fruit, uh, flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? If a trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance or without understanding. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. It's important that we speak words that are understandable. And if in the church you want to say something to somebody that's going to be encouraging or thoughtful or a teaching, I, I have to do this every Sunday. Make it simple, right? Is this simple enough for you? I try to make it simple because that's the way I understand it. If I just start uttering some language into the air like what happened at Babel, there's going to be no connection unless the Lord's part of it and unless it's a language you understand or unless he gives somebody the gift of interpretation. That is how I see the scripture properly using this particular gift. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're not helping anybody. It's really just about you. I just thought I'd point that out. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Babel which used to be gateway to God, is now known as blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Babel, right? If somebody's babbling, it's blah, blah, blah. I don't know what you're talking about. 
So that's, that's how Babel came to know, be known as Babel when actually Babel is the gateway to God. But it, it means confusion. So the question is, what are you building? What are you building in your life? With your time, with your finances, with your abilities, with your gifts. What are you building? I think about it and I think, Lord, am I, am I building a tower to my own edification for my own ego? Or am I doing it for you? And am I doing it for you or am I doing it for me? I start to ask all those questions. Now, when I sit down and I have a delicious steak, am I doing that for him? Lord, I'm going to eat this delicious steak with thankfulness. Or do I order the salad? Do you guys understand how deep this is? It's about every single moment bringing everything into submission to Christ. But it's the big things. What am I building? How do I spend my time? What proportion of my time am I at work? What proportion of time am I at home? What portion of time am I at the church? I have to determine, Lord, are these things in balance or do I have some of them out of balance? There's a degree in which we plan and we hope and we save and we strive. And yet, is it for him? Or is it for you? If you're like me, it's probably a mixture. And it's hard to separate, especially when your life is being shaken. It's like oil and water. They tend to mix somewhat when things are shaken. It's when we have a quiet time aside with the Lord and we ask him the question, Lord, what would you have me do? Am I building rightly? Are my priorities right? I just want to let you know that we're all free. But all choice has consequence. You can, you can spend your life any way that you want, right? You, you can get up and walk out right now if you wanted to. I won't even look at you. <laughs> but you see, we all have choice. But those choices have consequences. And there's a day in which we'll stand before the Lord and have to give an account for the things that we've done in the body. We should think on those things. We should be careful about our choices. Choices of what we say, how we spend our money, where we go, what we do. There are some people that make giant grand plans and if you ask them, say, did you uh, pray about this? Oh, I don't need to pray about it. I, I, I just know the numbers all work. You know, it's all good. Oh, so that's all it takes. As long as you have enough bricks. There's a giant missing ingredient. And unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord watches the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Ladies and gentlemen, we make decisions all the time based upon societal choices, economic choices, relational choices, and we don't consider the Lord first. That's what the Tower of Babel is about. It's about doing something for self and not considering what the Lord would do. Unity makes us stronger and dissension makes us weaker. Preserving peace is something that God gives all of us the job to do, not just the pastor. We are, all are to be interested in preserving peace. Self-aggrandizing leads to error and follows the poorest example. The, the, the example of Lucifer himself, when it's about I, I will be raised up, I will be, I will have, I, you know, the poorest example. Could God be frustrating your plans? Could God be frustrating your plans? If he came down in the middle of Babel and confused their languages so that they couldn't continue, could it be that the Lord has come down and frustrated your plans? And if so, you find yourself in a tug of war with him. I, I know who to put money on. These are thoughtful considerations that we should all be thinking about. And by the way, this stairway to heaven that he created, God has already created a stairway to heaven, uh, not the Led Zeppelin one from 1972. <laughs> 
It's interesting if you remember this story about Jacob's ladder where Jacob is uh, separated from his brother. Esau is chasing him. He's going to kill him because he stole a blessing from his dad. I don't even know you could do that. What, what would you wrap it in? So he's, he's running from Esau and, and he's troubled and he's in the middle of nowhere and he lays down and he pulls up a rock for a pillow just to tell you how hard he's got it. And he has this dream and the Lord shows him this ladder. Actually, they use the, the word ladder. We might use the word escalator because there's no angels going up and down on a ladder. That's ridiculous. It's more of a giant stairway that leads to heaven. And he's sitting there considering all of this. And when he gets up, he instantly makes a sacrifice to God and he pours oil on his rock and he says, God, you were in this place and I didn't even know it. This stairway to heaven was revealed to him so that he knew that God is with him. And he has help, by the way, that's what angels do. They help, they're ministers, they do what God tells them to do. They're better than most of us. They, yes, sir, uh, no problem, how high? You know, they're, they're good at it. And they're going up and down, which means they're bringing reports back and they're coming down and, and bringing encouragement and strength. And it was to be a, an encouragement to him because he thought he was going to lose his life because he just stole something he shouldn't have stolen. And God is reaffirming his relationship with him. And so he called the place Bethel, which is house of God, not Babel. Bethel, the house of God, because God was here and I didn't know it. Later on, he comes back to that same place and calls him as he's going back to meet up with his brother. And God confirms his appointment with him that he's not going to leave him or forsake him. And so God has created this wonderful thing for him. It says, then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. Same language as the Tower of Babel. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. But I already told you all that. I'm sorry. In the New Testament, we have a story very much like that. You have Nathaniel sitting underneath a fig tree and he's praying and he's reading through the scriptures, which is a good place to be if you want God to speak to you. And suddenly the Lord sees him and he says, uh, you're, I know who you are. And he goes, well, how do you know me, Lord? He goes, because I heard you when you were underneath the fig tree. And he goes, you're the son of God. It seems like an abrupt jump. Nathaniel was praying about something very specific. And Jesus knew what he prayed. I don't know about you, but I don't know what people pray before asking them what they prayed for. But Jesus did. And Jesus pulled this cool thing off with Nathaniel. And then he said in John 1:51, and he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. Jesus was claiming to be the stairway to heaven. He was claiming to be Jacob's ladder. Same exact language as the Old Testament. I wonder if that's what Nathaniel was reading. I think it was. You can ask him when you see him. God, Hebrews 1, God at various times and in various ways spoke in time past by the fathers and by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Don't go looking for the supernatural when God has spoken to us through his son. There's more to be found in the scriptures. There's more to be found in prayer than in any supernatural service you might be invited to. That is where you will meet with God because that is the stairway to heaven who's Jesus Christ himself. I hope you never hear that song again and think of anything else. One final word, Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter seven, verses 24 to 27 says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house 
and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. We've lived through a hurricane when Sandy blew through here and saw what it can do and just take things out. Life is like that hurricane. And if you don't have your life squarely fixed on the teachings of Jesus Christ, your life will fall apart. It's said that a person who has a Bible that's falling apart has a life that isn't. The rock is not Jesus. The rock is doing what Jesus said. And some people think Jesus is the rock. Well, he is. But it's doing what he said because hearing it is of no value unless it's put into practice. Amen? Amen. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Because we're all going to serve someone, aren't we? With our actions, with our attitudes, with our thoughts, with our words, with our finances, with our plans. We are all serving somebody. And I don't want to be found building a tower or a city that doesn't last. I want one that lasts. How about you? You want a life that's going to benefit other people and point people to Jesus Christ? That's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you everything. And yet we have his assurances that even if we sleep on a rock, he's with us. And he won't leave us or forsake us. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the only one between God and man, the only mediator. And you don't need anyone else. Amen? Amen. Amen.